G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. We're doing it remotely because of COVID. I am Kate McDonald and with me is the co-host Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Never better mate, but uh, last time we did the podcast remotely from, you know, 100 kilometres away, uh, yes. the audio came through a, a little bit questionable from your end and I just <laughs> want to do a double check now. Considering I'm not in the room and I'm not there to babysit you, you little <laughs> media rookie, um, how's it looking? Mate, is your audio on? Uh, coming through loud and clear. You know what I think it is? I think it's I got complacent when you weren't here. I wasn't setting up the room the way I normally do. I was just setting it up against against my plain white wall, uh, you know, just next to my desk. It was real lazy stuff, but I've set the lights, I've set the uh, the microphone and everything up in front of where you normally would be. So I'm back to basics and, uh, yeah, it's all coming through beautifully. Have you got a little cardboard cutout of me sitting there or is it more just, you know, you, I'm, I'm there in soul and spirit? No, there is. It's just off camera to my okay. right. There's a little cardboard cutout and um, you're looking good. So that's what I'm talking to currently. But it, it's good to be back. Um, obviously, in COVID times, we, we can't get together, but we've had the practice of doing it uh, at each other's houses and it seems to come through all right. Did, did, when, you, when get right. did you eat the curry beforehand? What, what have you gone for dinner this week? Well, technically, I have eaten the curry beforehand because I've had it the last two nights. I made it on Saturday huh. night. Um, went a home job and then I had leftovers last night and I haven't had dinner tonight. So technically my last two dinners have been curry. Well, what, what are you, sensational. what are you having tonight? Uh, I'm going to something a little bit different. Um, I'm making a pesto pasta, which is standard bit of sun dried tomato in there, but Delicious. being the veggie, you know, I can't throw chicken in there. I wanted to beef it up a little bit. So I'm, th- I'm frying up some potatoes and making a, a potato pesto pasta, a PPP party. <laughs> That sounds absolutely unbelievable. Um, let's kick things off with <laughs> our teams. Should, should we <laughs> talk? That, should that, we talk some footy? Or was that a good segue? Yeah, lovely. <laughs> um, let, let, let's talk about our teams on the weekend, Rog. We'll touch base about the D's and the Blues, but before we do, I want to give you some facts about the D's and the Blues. Oh. Um, obviously, I talk pretty consistently about how it never happens out. Both our teams winning on the same weekends, and that comes from both our teams sort of struggling to win most yeah. seasons. Um, I got a great message from friend of the show, uh, loyal listener Tom Daffy. Um, I bumped into him at the captain's bar in Geelong a couple of times, but he, he sent in a message saying that he's he was listening to the Back Pocket Plugger podcast and he's got some stats. Here we go. This is our. So, this might be our first bit of legitimate insight <laughs> for the season so far, and not just us <laughs> pretending like we have an idea of what we're talking about. So since the 1998 season, he was assuming that's when you were born. It was when I was born. There has been 511 rounds. Oh, God. (laughs) Only on 66 occasions have Carlton and Melbourne (laughs) won uh, both times that round. Wow. Uh, He said uh, the most in a season was in 2000. We both won nine. Um, He said 2018 was an interesting season. Uh, Carlton only won two games. But both were won on rounds where Melbourne won. Whoa. So even chalked up a couple, even though the wins weren't weren't, weren't coming that uh, that frequently. But yeah, unbelievable <laughs> stats. That, Only 66 times. That <laughs> is some of the most impressive stat work I've ever seen. This That's <laughs> such impressive stat work. It gets to a point where I'm going, has he just made that up and it, and it sounds so legit that we've just backed it in? I don't know how you could possibly crunch that into a calculator, but we'll take his word for it and just say that that is what the Daff Meister was it. That is some of the most. Yeah, the Daff, the most unbelievable work by the Daff we've ever seen. That might be a. We might have Daff's <laughs> Daff start of the week every week. <laughs> I'm curious to see what else he has in the arsenal. He put it down to some uh, some lockdown procrastination because he's gone back through 511 rounds of football and only 66 times that both our teams won, which is uh, yeah. which is a little bit unfortunate. He must have already used the old free month on Pornhub if he's uh, using his <laughs> using his spare spare lockdown time to dig up that. But thank you so much. It means the world. But yes, let's talk some demons and some baggers. Um, maybe we maybe we start with the baggers, considering they're probably the negative, and uh, we'll work our way into the positive. Sounds good. So what happened on the weekend, Rog? I was watching the game. Um, it was one of those games where I feel like most people would probably tip against the Blues, but one of those sort of games where if the Blues got the scalp, you'd start to 
really begin to see a lot of improvement in the side. They couldn't quite get the job done, but it was by no means a, a poor performance. Uh, how did you see it? Uh, the way I saw it was, what round are we up to now? Is it 9 or 10? 11. A, round 11, and we're yet to take a scalp. So, you know, we've just beaten the teams that are well below us. You know, we've even lost to Collingwood, but we're still yet to take that scalp. Not that Sydney is the biggest scalp of all time. Like, you know, they're, they're a good side, don't get me wrong, but it's not like beating Melbourne or the Dogs. But, um, yeah, we're yet to take a scalp, so I was really looking forward to getting one on the board because at the moment it just feels like we're a proper just below mid-tier team and we're just beating the real bottom teams. Yep. Um, and as the game went on, it just became more and more evident that we're quite clearly not good enough um, in so many aspects, don't work hard enough defensively. But... Um, what's frustrating is people go, you know, they'll say honourable loss and they'll go, you know, you're playing a good side in Sydney, they're a top eight and possibly even a top four sniff um, mm. and you're playing them away um, and, you know, you went with them for three quarters, dropped away in the last, but, uh, you know, honourable loss. But I I've, I've more think, you know, Sydney would made finals, you know, 10 years consecutively or whatever it may have been. They dropped out to do their rebuild for one year, maybe two, and then they're back into the eight and they're a top four chance. And we're five years into our rebuild and we've been even worse for longer than that. We've been a poor football team for 20 years, really. But we're five years into this rebuild um, and Sydney are one, one year into theirs or two years and they've beaten us quite comfortably. So it was disappointing. I do make, it does make me wonder where have we gone wrong. Um, and you're starting with every loss like that. It just, there's starting to be less and less light at the end of the tunnel, and you're starting to lose more and more faith. To be honest with you, Doss. Uh, was there any positive takeaways from the weekend? It seemed like you started the game quite well. I thought. Correct me if I'm wrong. I was sort of playing a bit of FIFA and checking the the game as I went. Did you get out to a little bit of a lead? Yeah, through, got out through the second term. Yeah, got out to about a four goal lead, I reckon. Um, but you know, our lapses. I don't know what we put our lapses, uh, goal lapses to, because it happens every week where we concede five on the trot. It's um, beyond yeah. absurd. And to be honest with you, you know, the thought that I had during the week is that, um, or over the weekend, is that. Carlton, you know, being one of the big four clubs, it always, to me, had that that vibe or, you know, the feel that, yeah, we, we might be trash now, we might have been a trash, trash for a long time, but we're the Carlton Football Club. We will get back to the pinnacle. We will be one of the best teams in the competition again. Yeah. Um, whereas the way I see it, um, and apologies to any St Kilda supporters listening, um, <laughs> but if I'm a Saints fan, I'm sitting there, as we touched on it last week, but I'm there going... You know, we're 150 years deep. We've only won the one flag. You know, it's been a whole lot of disappointment. You know, and you think that there's a possibility. You may never reach that. Obviously, at some point, if the game keeps going, you will win another premiership. But you go mm. in with a lot of pessimism because you know what your club's history is. And yep. for me, I always thought Carlton will, you know, we're such a historic club. We will pull ourselves out of it. But at the moment, I feel like we're completely detached from the Carlton of old. And we are so much closer to being a St Kilda or a Gold Coast right now than we are a, a Sydney or, a, you know, a, a West Coast mm. or one of these other teams that are just bred to succeed. Um, even yeah. a Collingwood, you know, like they just every five or ten years bob up and bloody make the top four. So I just feel like we're so detached from, detached from that and I don't see us getting back to that powerhouse anytime soon. Yeah, from the outside, I spoke to the Blue abroad uh, just before our game and he was sort of mentioning going into the D's game, sort of that, that frustration of where the Blues are at and the team, to me, just reminds me of like a, a 2017 D's. Like a, a team, uh, in 2017, I was watching the D's going, I feel like we should be better than what we are. But when you fast forward four years and have the perspective that the Melbourne supporters have now and look back on the 2017 Demons, you can tell that they just weren't ready. And to me, the Blues, they are that sort of eighth potentially side, but more than likely not an, a top eight side, but they're not that far away. There's still a lot of development to go, which can be frustrating, especially when you've been patient for so long. But I feel like you're, you're closer to success than you think. Um, uh, and The only question is... Um 
What, why do you think it's taken so long for Carlton and why does it still seem like it? You know, this the narrative is, oh, you know, just wait, be patient. But there are other mm. teams like, like a Sydney that um, are capable of dropping out and coming back in or a Port Adelaide on the back of Rose, A.E. Butters and Dersma um, and capable of popping right back up into contention. It's frustrating that it is taking this long and, you know, it may – it's – your, the way you're just talking about it is if it almost seems inevitable that we will come good, these kids will, and they're not mm. kids anymore. But I don't see that inevitability. I, th- I see a very real possibility that um, we peak at an eighth, we peak at a seventh, we might win an odd final, we might make a semi-final, who knows. Um, yeah. But we're not quite good enough to match it with a Brisbane or a Melbourne or a Bulldogs uh, list. You know, we you look at B- Butters, Dersma, Rosie, um, and the way Sydney's done it in a couple of drafts. And then you look at some of our selections, you know, don't get me wrong, obviously we're up with Walshie and Mackay and would have Weedering and potentially Charlie Curno if he gets back on the park. But I look mm. at it and I go, O'Brien, Dial, Petrovsky, Seaton, who I, you know, I still have a bit of faith in these blokes, but they're not, when you're getting first round draft picks and you're rebuilding, you need to get them right. And, yeah, it looks like that with at least a couple of them, we could have got it drastically wrong, and that that's the difference between being a top four sniff, a genuine top four sniff, and being a team that makes up the numbers in the eight. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but there you go. Enough, yep. d- enough doom and gloom about my uh, blue bayers. Uh, let's talk about brighter days, rainbows, sunshine, and ice cream, <laughs> and that is the Melbourne Demons, mate. That is one of the most, co- in fact, probably the most comprehensive victory you're likely to ever see. Well, they just keep doing it against the big tests, um, and we've had the big test slash audit a couple of times this year. We came up against Geelong after, you know, uh, I think. We, we were 3-0, and came up against Geelong, and everyone was saying, wow, this is where they get done. And an amazing performance against Geelong, really solid performance. Then we came up against the Tigers, and this is you know, where everyone started going, oh, well, they'll get done here. Amazing performance against the Tigers. They just love stepping up for these big games, this group. Um, and it's like, yeah, the, the, win, uh, the loss probably came at a good time, but it's like, regardless of the, the win or loss, they really set themselves for Friday night footy, top of the table. Uh, this team thinks, you know, they're... they're I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know. It's like a really good mentality the, um, that this group has. And to go out and get the job done against the best side in the comp at the stadium where they dismantle teams, I thought it was really, really impressive. Um and I know you were asking me in round six about whether I start to believe or whatnot um, after we beat the Tigers. Here we go. Did, here we go. Here we go. Get excited. <laughs> and I did start to believe, but there was still a part of me that goes, I believe in terms of like, yeah, we could win enough games to maybe finish quite high, but I'm still not convinced we can get it done. The lid, <laughs> after the, the game, lid is off, is it? Is it officially uncapped? After the game on Friday night, there's no reason why we can't beat anyone anywhere i don't think on the biggest um, stage in the last day a weekend in september bring it on honestly bring it on I, I can't believe how well this team defends i can't believe how well how hard they are like the doggies are a really slick midfield but in the nitty and gritty i think that we blow them off the park in that area and we did and i don't know it's that sort of sort of stuff that hard contested brand that really tightly uh, you know, tight knit team defense. That's the stuff that holds up um, later on in the year. So I'm just really, really excited. And I've, yeah, I just can't believe how well they're performing. It is amazing to uh, see. And I think we've talked about this previously on the pod, but when we went live to the game and we sat behind the goals for the Carlton Melbourne game, to see your grid, like as soon as the ball's turned over, Melbourne players just get into position into this grid that is impenetrable. And then, Obviously, as you do when a de- when a, your opposition sets up a, a really effective zone, you try to switch it. So then they have to move across and maybe someone gets caught napping and that's your avenue to goal. But when yep. Carlton had possession and watching closely Melbourne every game since, every team you come up against, they try and switch it. But your grid shifts as one. It is perpetual motion. No one lapses. Mm. And... Um, 
you know, players switch the ball and Melbourne are out on the other side of the wing before Carlton are or any team you happen to be playing. It is unbelievable to watch just no team have an outlet. It is so well drilled. And it just makes me seriously question how every team, like, can't emulate that. Like, what, how is it? How have you perfected the art of the defensive setup so well? It, <laughs> like, how are you that much better than everyone else at it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's just it's taken years and years and years and years, and like they've they've talked about the connection between the players, and you can just tell uh, how like you can just see it. The, I think you were saying um, the understanding of 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 the team because like even when we're getting tackled by three or four defenders, you see like little handballs and it's almost a little bit Hollywood, but a Salem will fling a handball over his head and he just knows a Brayshaw's around to, to be there, to be that outlet. Like they just have this amazing understanding of each other. And um, to hear Christopher Petrarca after the game sort of break down how they do it and how they trust the tackler. Um, I was watching on access all areas. They had footage of the D's trusting the tackler. So when one person goes to bond, to put some pressure on, um, instead of a second or third person coming in, they 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 lay off and they they trust the tackler to be able to hold him and and then oh, it's just a brilliant game plan. It puts pressure on at the source. It it, it really helps the defenders and um, they they've all bought into it and it's really amazing. And I it's just crazy. Um, you know, I, I've been trying to keep keep the lid on it and and not get too excited, but. I am trying to really embrace it now because there's once in every 60 years your team gets in a position like this. I really feel like we have a really good chance at it this year and the next couple of years and it's just it's crazy that um that they've gotten to this position. Imagine uh you make a grand <laughs> final um and we still haven't gotten on top of the covid yet and you're not in the stands to watch it. Could you? <sighs> that is just the most heartbreaking Thought, but yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you surely will be on top of it by September. It'll be a hundred thousand in the G, and you'll be sitting there because, in my eyes, there is no chance the demons don't make the grand final. Because <laughs> this, quite, quite seriously, I don't see a world unless of calamity with injury. When it comes to September, they are so well drilled. I can't see a world in which they lose that game unless all of your <laughs> all of your players forget how to kick goals. So, um, you know, whether you win the grand final is another question, but I. Can't see how you do not make it <laughs> to the big dance. Um, oh, it's crazy. Uh, moving on to another team that is extremely impressive and very well could be the team you face up against in that last day of September. Yeah, it's the Brisbane Lions for mine. I think they might be number two in the power rankings. I think they probably are as well. They are dismantling football sides left, right and centre. Um, they don't want for anything either. They look pretty complete across the ground. And um, I don't know, it's quite weird. Like You see a Geelong who make flags every year um, and, and the way they're going about it isn't as good as the way like a Brisbane Lions are going about it at this current time and that can all change. But yeah, the Lions, they don't want for anything uh, anywhere on the park and they're starting to put together, I think, seven wins in a row now. So it makes this clash on Friday night. Whose audit do you think it is more? Do you think it's... Um, is this the one where if the Lions get over the top of the Ds, you really start to get impressed it's, by them? Or it, Yeah, it's the Lions' audit. It's up to them to prove that they are, in fact, a contender. The Demons now have established and proven that they are the real deal and they will be there at the nitty-gritty in September. Now it's up to the Lions. You've won seven on the trot. Now it's like, okay, are you, are you, really, are you really that good? Are you really a premiership contender? Let's find out. Jeez, yeah. So pumped for that clash. Uh, who, who's who? Who impresses you the most um, at the Lions? Uh, oh, gee, there's there's plenty of them. Starsevich down back. He's one that um, we and we just love a back pocket plugger, don't we? That's just yeah. our favourite thing <laughs> in the world. And he's probably leading. Not that we've introduced this yet, or are really planning to. But if we were to be having a back pocket plugger medal, you know, and more than likely to be named after Cade Simpson. Jeez, Starsevich is in the lead, and he? he's just been doing the job on every forward known to man. Yeah, he's been super impressive. Obviously, McLuggage has gone to another level. Um, and, and Mitchie Robinson on the weekend, I think he had oh, 35 or 30-something, 30 um, kicked four. They, they've just got players everywhere just uh, performing, and it's 
why they're they are the rocketing up the ladder. They're not just a premiership fancy, um, but they're also the most watchable team in the league by some. Yep. Well, by probably no, oh, not by some margin. It's very close. But me loving the fine intricacies of football. When I watch Melbourne, I have the biggest erection you've ever seen because I <laughs> love seeing that grid slide across from side to side. You get the ball, you do the discipline thing. Don't get me wrong, Cozzy is as flashy as it gets, but for the most part, you're more just picking the right mm. option and um, methodically uh, cool, calm and calculated working your way through it. It's amazing to see and I love watching that as much as anyone. But for most yep. neutrals and prob- yeah, to a degree with myself as well, watching the way Brisbane move the footy um, and the flair they do it with and the confidence of the run, the pace, um, they are probably the most watchable team in the league and probably the most exciting. I think the matchup on Friday night, uh, the big the big question is how, how much can the Ds limit the Lions scoring. They did it against the Western Bulldogs. The Western Bulldogs only scored 60 on Marvel, which is insane when they average over the hundreds. But I think over the last seven weeks, um, since the Lions have been winning, they've been, I think they average in the 120s um, for f- like for scores four. So that'll be the big test on Friday night. Absolutely. I'll be tipping the Ds. Is the game at the Gabba or is it at a neutral ground? It'll be neutral. It won't be a, a Lions home game. So they're thinking SCG, but I hate the dimensions of the SCG. It's too small. Yeah. Um, I'd like it at Giant Stadium if we could. But, um, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, I just hope it's not at the Gabba because that would be a bit of a stitch-up, even Metricon at least. Yeah, absolutely. That would be a stitch-up. Hopefully it's at a neutral ground and we can watch your boys absolutely fly just like Jack Rewell did on the weekend. Oh, boy. What a grab. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Are we that th- was the run back with the flight hanger. Yeah. Wow, what a mark. Uh, well, runs in, yeah, the, like, runs in the DNA, runs in the blood. <laughs> well, it's probably the best rewalt mark I've seen. Now. Yeah. Um, to, to go back with the flight and then get the launch of a Jeremy Howe hanger, um, it was like both brave and skillful. And the... the <laughs> and at a super Mar- crucial time of the game and goes back and kicks a goal. Marbiel Chol absolutely nails him because he's coming over the top from the other side. If Marbiel Chol didn't nail him, though, Jack Rewell was going to springboard like over the top and almost cartwheel over the top. That's how the forward roll. insane it was. Yeah. So uh, Marbiel Chol nailing him probably helped him in the end there, but it was just... It's probably one of the best marks I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of people sort of trying to uh, take away from it a little bit, going, oh, you know, it wasn't that good. That's it not, was that's seriously... Not, that's not like it the footy was, public to just take the negative <laughs> approach to everything. Especially not on Twitter, no. We can get rid of that part of our culture, can't we? Why is our first instinct to just be negative? Why, don't, why can't we just be a bit more positive footy public? It was one of the greatest marks I've ever seen. You, so you're <laughs> declaring it mark of the year? Yeah. I'd love to see it. I would love for that to be mark of the year. If Sam Walsh is was mark of the year last year, then I think this is more than deserving of being mark of the year. And it's um, you know, once a mark doesn't uh, one mark doesn't define your career. But gee, as time and time goes on, the question of Jack Rewalt versus Nick Rewalt is starting to be quite compelling. I think it's comprehensively. I think Jack Rewalt. <laughs> well, Jack Rewalt's got a better got a better resume. For sure. Yeah. Like almost like really shits on Nick Reynolds, to be honest. But what about um, um and I haven't got the numbers, but what from a from a best and fairest um and an all Australian point of view, um, do you have any idea where we're tracking? I think, it? N- I think Nick I was watching Fox Footy the other day. I think it flashed up Nick has five. Yep. All Australians. And I think or maybe it was five best and fairest. I wouldn't be surprised if it's both. Yeah. But what? Jack Reynolds got three Coleman's Three, three premierships. Col- See, three Coleman's on its own <laughs> is just yeah. is just good enough to stack up against really anybody. Um, yeah, three premierships. Um, geez, he's been very, very good. Uh, but to be fair, I think Jack Rewalt probably has the better resume, but I still think Nick Rewalt was probably the better player. Yeah, I think that I think that's the general consensus. But it is amazing that when Jack started out, you know, he was a bit of a whipping boy of the competition. Everyone thought he, he was a massive whipping boy. He might just be getting getting a game because of his name and he wasn't quite that good. But for now, uh, now for him to be, you could legitimately argue the case that he is a better footballer than Nick Rewalt. It is, 
Absolutely amazing and good on you, Jack Rewell. You wouldn't have uh, happened to watch the Europa League final a couple uh, couple of days ago, would you? Well, I'm the biggest. Uh, <laughs> I'm the biggest. What's the word? Uh, plastic. Uh, <laughs> fair weather Manchester United supporter you'll ever see. Um, so no, I didn't get up to watch it, but I did see what happened. But do you want to talk us through the drama? I don't. I think even the most diehard of Manchester United supporters wouldn't have been getting up to watch a Europa League final against Vir- Villarreal. People think it's a bit of a <laughs> phony competition, but uh, yeah, w- it was a one-all uh, draw, I believe, and uh, ended up going to going to penalties, and. Uh, it was one of the most bizarre penalty shootouts I've ever seen because it, every single person that went up to take the kick looked like they were going to score. You know how usually when someone takes a penalty, they might look a bit nervy. You're almost waiting them for, for them to miss sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it happens with set shots in footy as well. Every single person taking the ball looked like they were going to bury it, and they did. And the keepers didn't even look close. Like they did not once <laughs> get close. So each team took 10 penalties. They scored all 10, amazing, and then it got to the keepers. The Villarreal goalkeeper scored. Then David De Gea, who's just conceded 10 penalties in a row and then uh, <laughs> and then had a chance to save the game for his team, uh, he missed the penalty, so Villarreal won. Um, and it got me thinking, surely there has to be a better system than penalties in soccer. It just seems like that's such a... After all this massive competition, you're going to decide it on what may as well be a coin flip. There has to be a better system than that. And then I got started thinking, I wonder if in AFL, uh, if instead of, um, you know, we, we used to have the drawn grand final and then you have the replay, which was the most bizarre system of all time. Whose idea was that? Mm. Uh, <laughs> And then it turns into now we've got the draw and then we have extra time, which makes a lot of sense. But imagine if it was after two halves of extra time, scores are still level. Imagine if instead of going to another half, we did a penalty shootout style. And that style would be each team picks a a forward, uh, Mm. three forwards, and each team picks three backs. The ball gets fired in and you've got a 3v3 inside forward 50 or... (laughs) Three consecutive one v ones. If you'd rather do it like a penalty shootout style, and whoever yep. whoever uh, kicks a goal, kicks a goal wins. So obviously the three, um, yeah. If you wanted to do it one after another, uh, you have three different shootouts. Or if you'd want to just fire it in, you have three forwards and three backs. Uh, you play it twice. Well, you play it twice is- over. So then um, each team has a go having forwards and backs. This is sort of what they do in the NHL. They have a, I don't know what it's called, but in the NHL hockey, it's like a one-on-one where the attacker gets to walk down uh, the skate rink. <laughs> that'll with, that'll with do. The, with, with the puck in hand, and he gets one shot um, at the keeper, but he gets like a run-up, and the keeper can either charge him or just stay at home. And That's how, yeah, there's believe it or not, that's how they used to do penalty shootouts in the MLS. So when the MLS yes, yes. first started, they wanted they didn't they wanted to still be a little bit Americanized with hockey and whatnot, and uh, yeah, that's how they went about it. And I think that's way better than just a fight out shootout anyway. Um, but my question to you, uh, and I asked you this before the podcast started, is if yep. you could ha- take your pick for this penalty shootout and you had to pick three attackers and three defenders from any player you've seen, who would it be? How about you fire one forward and then I'll fire a back in return at you? I've gone modern day players. Is that wrong? Me too. And I've gone very stereotypical. I haven't really gone anything that outside the box. All right. Well, I've gone a little bit outside the box because I'm not sure whether it's like a key defender or what the go is. But I want someone who can kick a snag and kick a snag late. Um, my only issue is his size. But anyway, I've my first player for the one-on-one penalty shootout is Robbie Gray. Oh, great call. See, that is <laughs> – seriously, that – that is an unbelievably good call. <laughs> I, I, I think that might be the best call of the lot. And it's the first one. Robbie Gray, he is the man you want taking your penalty for you in a shootout. He is the man you want one-on-one inside 50. Yeah. Anyway. It, yeah, so so if it did hit the deck, I feel like he could compete. I'm just concerned if you go a real intercepting key back. Depends how the ball gets kicked in. Is it like 
bunted along the ground or kicked high and long. I, 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 re- I reckon concerned. you don't know what's coming. We fire it out of a cannon and the cannon <laughs> randomly selects. Is it going to be a drop punt high up in the air, giving the contested market chances? Is it going to be along the ground? You do not know. It's a chaos. Yes, the cannon. We do need the cannon. Um, Trent McKenzie is just standing at the top of the 50. In <laughs> for me. Um, okay, so you're, you've gone with uh, Robbie Gray. My backman in response to Robbie Gray is, yep. is Luke Hodge. So we've got Robbie Gray oh, v, v Luke Hodge inside 50. I just feel like if Luke Hodge is your defender, he will f- forget throwing the kitchen sink, mate. He'll throw the entire suburb that you live in at, uh, at <laughs> making sure he doesn't kick the goal. So we'll leave it in the comments for them to decide. First contest, Robbie Gray v Luke Hodge, who you got? Um, <laughs> I'm going to fire a forward at you. Yep. I mean, it's just a, the obvious option, isn't it? They're, Dustin Martin. Well, who have you got to um, who have you got to stop Dusty? Well, as I said, all my players currently play. So this matchup was a couple of weeks ago, but I've got Tom Stewart. Oh, great matchup once again. See, imagine uh, the drama of the ball <laughs> fighting, and you've got Tom out Stewart. Of the cannon. Tom Stewart out the cannon. We don't know what's coming, and it's <laughs> Dustin Martin against Tom Stewart. That would be. If, if they ever did the state of origin and they brought in an all star weekend. This would be just a great competition to run one on one from side forward fifty. Um, oh, geez, you'd, you'd probably say Dusty in the clutch moment to win the game. That's when he really comes to life. But Tommy Stewart, he's that sort of defender that will fight tooth and nail for his life to try and defend the great Dusty Martin. Absolutely. Okay, who's your next forward? All right, so I've just backed in the absolute. Dusty Martin 2.0, really strong, great hands. Uh, I've gone Christian Petrarca. Ah, oh, lovely. And great at ground level as well. So who who's stopping the track? All right, well, I'll go to stop the track. I'm backing in Alex Rance. Oh, that's great. I think Rance v the track would be... P- Petrarca might... I think Rance was decept- deceptively... Had a bit of pace about him, didn't he? He might be able yeah, to... He did. Might be able to keep up with the pace of the track, but once again, we'll leave it to the great people in the comments to decide who wins that one. Uh, my next forward, sizzling mm. Cyril Rioli. Imagine him on the biggest stage, grand final day, extra time, penalties, inside forward 50. You've got Cyril at ground level. Oh, he's doing damage. Who have you got to, who have you got to stop Cyril? Well, I don't think anyone stops Cyril. I've, I've, I've got all current day players. I'm going to go a throwback player to match your throwback player. Yep. I'm going to go Glenn Archer. <laughs> oh, Cyril, <laughs> I think, Cyril be the shin boner of the century himself. I think Glenn Archer, he may not have the attributes, but he'll do anything. He will He will do anything to make sure Cyril Rioli does not kick that goal. So I think that could be a matchup for the A's. So ages. Glenn Archer v Cyril, uh, make your choice known. Uh, throw your last forward at me. Uh, I got the Tomahawk. Oh, see, Deep bustling, really strong. Yeah, Obviously. see, this is going to be good as well. I have gone left field for my fullback. Who have you gone? Liam Bones Jones. Wow. Tom Hawk wins. <laughs> <laughs> well, he probably does, and I'll have no complaints with that. But the the issue with Liam Jones is that he has no idea how to defend in a team setup because he just gets lost. He lets his player run off. But when he's purely one on one, I would argue there's just about no better one on one defender in the league. Um, I, I think his pace could match up with anyone you throw in there, which would just be massive. And he just always gets a fist on it. I think if the if you take out the whole game and it's purely Liam beat this man in a one on one, I think he's as good as any. But um, my last forward, I'll follow. I'll fire at you. It'd be the biggest crime against football and possibly even humanity if this man didn't get a mention. Uh, Lance Buddy Franklin. Well, I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna throw Darcy Moore at Buddy. Oh. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine that? One on one, grand final, inside forward fifty, buddy V more. Ah, you'd pay great money to see it. Absolutely. Um so yeah, obviously comment down uh below who you think would win those matchups. Fight out of the cannon, grand final, penalty shootout to decide. You let us know. And um, uh, we- Yeah, you go, mate. Oh, should we move on to the uh, the GBOs? Oh, the main event. The the whole reason why uh, this podcast is alive and thriving. I think we absolutely should. Um, are we starting on the out on the fools? Start on the out on the fools. Uh, you fire away, mate. I'll fire away. Uh, watched a great game of footy on Saturday night. Uh, the Bombers 
Uh, no, no, it wasn't Gold Coast Hawthorne. Um, it was <laughs> the, the Bombers taking on the Eagles. Jeez, I think we might have had the Eagles a couple of times um, throughout our, our well, obviously throughout the pods, and they've been a bit of a watch, and they've been a bit of a how do they come back from here? I'm prepared to put a line through them in the Premiership run. In terms of winning a flag this year, I think the line can go through the West Coast Eagles. The line is 100% through them for the flag. In my opinion, the line is 100% through them for the top four. And now it's just a question of can they cling on to a top eight position? Um, and I'm yep. dubious. I'm looking at some of the teams that slotted the eight that are impressing. Richmond's just come in, but, you know, Western playing good footy. And I think... Um, West Coast, unless they do something, they sharply turn around their form. Um, I see possibly another team sneaking in. My biggest questions comes from like a more of a fitness point of view. They just that second half, the Bombers absolutely dominated them. Um, I don't really understand how Nick Nat's only playing sixty five, seventy five percent game time. He's been back for long enough, hadn't he? Yeah, he has been, and I just he, he just he comes on for those bursts, and obviously, we all love Nick Nat and what he can do. He's very amazing when he does come on the ground, but he obviously doesn't have the tank, or maybe it's just the team plan that he doesn't decide to play longer. Um, and yeah, the way they faded out of that game on the weekend was was crazy. Considering the Bombers have a plethora of young players who you'd probably suggest aren't full blown AFL ready. Um, they they ran a pretty mature West Coast team off their feet. Absolutely. Very fair out in the full. Um, and they'll be out in the full next week as well, even unless they pick up their act. Um, <laughs> they are well and truly in the crosshairs. But my out in the full is not just Collingwood, but the game plan specifically. Um, and it's been talked about a lot over the weekend. But we were talking earlier about how Brisbane are the most watchable player, uh, watchable team in the league. Um, and how you know good the demons are to watch for different reasons as well. But you watch Collingwood play, and even when they are sort of winning, it's not an attractive brand of football at all. Mm. Um, and now questions are being asked of Buckley's playing future, not because they're losing, because you know it happens when they made a grand final, and now this is their bottom out, and that happens, and you, <coughs> that's how the draft and equalisation works in our game. But... It's one thing to lose, but it's another thing to play the most boring game plan in the league, bar none. So a few question marks over Buckley there. It'll be interesting to see if he buckles, no pun intended, to pressure and um, starts playing a more exciting brand or if he sticks in even more and he just keeps on chipping 15-metre kicks around the boundary line. Well, they've they've been playing football since the 1800s, the Pies, and they have never had one goal to three-quarter time. Yeah. Uh, like that is that's <laughs> that is not good. It was first time <laughs> in like 150 years or something stupid like that since they hadn't scored a goal in the first half of the MCG. Um, that is that's crazy. But my boy Trent Bianco, oh, is he a player of the future? I can't believe Carlton didn't pick him up earlier when we had a few picks beforehand. Class, and uh, he's one to look forward to for the Pirates. Yeah, ball magnet. Um, are we onto the behinds? We are onto the behinds. I want to go with uh, the COVID situation. Bit of a watch. Um, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> I may, uh, there, you might be the only person in the on the entire planet to render COVID a behind and not an out in the full. <laughs> no, it could it could be worse. It could be worse. COVID ruin livelihoods and finances and the whole global economy and uh, uh, it's torn families apart. But other than that, it's 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 just a behind. <laughs> watch this look space. At it. <laughs> it's killed. Hundreds of millions, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's yeah, I'm still up in the air with it. Um, no, obviously, COVID situation with the AFL really, really worrying. Um, considering what happened last year and how much the season got thrown off, and obviously, when we talk about COVID on this podcast, it's more from a football point of view, not from a uh, world. Uh, pandemic point of view where it's obviously but if you, you do know. want to hear that you can catch us on our on our <laughs> pandemic podcast which is hitting all good streaming services uh, next week oh the back pocket pandemic podcast <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so yeah from a footy point of view eh, you, you get that that well f- me personally you get those nerves going out the spine when you start to th- hear things of hubs and teams leaving the state and you think about how the grand final was taken away from the MCG last year and all those sort of thoughts um, come creeping into your your head. But hopefully, 
hopefully it's one of those ones where it is just a month. Um, footy does continue to, to plug along as it does. Footy finds a way. But, yeah, it's uh, it's got me a little bit nervous at this point in time. Yes, well, my uh, I, I do have faith knowing that if we could survive last season, which was made up on the fly, like they didn't even know COVID was a thing heading into it, if they could find yeah. a way to survive last year, then they more than certainly will find a way to survive this year considering – they had they have every contingency contingency plan uh, in place that you can possibly imagine. If there was a situation, grand finals at Optus Stadium, the D's are in it. Um, we can, the Melbournians can't leave the state. This is a serious question. Would you consider a border hop? <laughs> sort of like uh, Mexico, uh, America, sort of, yeah. you know, just <laughs> jump the wall. You actually you actually couldn't because you are so high profile that at a Demons Grand Final, everyone would know that you've jumped the border. But I can guarantee, I can almost guarantee, I reckon, that if you if you weren't someone that would be recognised, if, if it was me, if Carlton made a Grand Final in Perth, I, I would. There's not even a question about it. I'd be trying to hop that border. What's the worst that can happen? They turn you away. There would have to be a border crossing between the Northern Territory in South Australia and WA, like that whole big strip. Surely, if you go full desert, there's some sort of fence that you can get through without just police being there. It'd, Surely, it'd be one hell of a vlog. Yeah, um, <laughs> it would be one of the all-time great vlogs. No, a hundred percent. I'd I would be exhausting every option. I'd be yes, going no, sub would, submarine style option, uh, ocean type operation. If it is at the Gabba again or whatnot, and they do allow Victorians in, I am I'm going. There's no yeah. and the D's make it. I'm going. There's no way two ways about it. Without a doubt. But moving on to my behind, uh, and that is, and this might seem stiff, but it is the doggies. Um, and look, they've been an unbelievable team all season and they played the best team of the season and they lost. So, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a real shame in losing to the to the cream of the crop. Um, but the reason why they're my behind is because they were you know, just about most people's premiership fancy. Um, and then they played the real premiership fancy, in my opinion, and they got absolutely exposed. It wasn't one where they... Just got uh, they just got beaten a contentious umpiring decision they played well but you know um, when they play again later in the season they'll have your measure it was they were comprehensively beaten in every aspect and um, I struggle to see how they can so drastically turn it around next time they play her. Um so for mine they went from um, you know I, I had Melbourne uh, as my premiership favourite, with the doggies just behind them by, you know, a fraction. But for mine now, the Demons are the clear premiership favourites and the Bulldogs have a hell of a lot to w- of work to do. So that's why they're my behind this week. Uh, that's, um, yeah, I, I feel like the dogs will be okay. It's just the two games where we've seen them really under the pump and the, the game not going their way, they haven't gotten up. So uh, that is a little bit concerning. Uh Hey, wait, sorry, you weren't really quiet. I thought you weren't there. No, I, I, am, I am here. Fire your six-pointer at me. Uh, six-pointer. Obviously, I was talking about the great game I watched on the weekend. The Bombers get one of the biggest ticks you'll ever get on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast from me. Um, I did tip them just off the cuff to be a wooden spoon fancy in <laughs> season predictions and was well and truly <laughs> told that they're going to be finals bound. And after the first couple of rounds, I was looking like, the uh, mystic Mac that I am. But no, they've put together a couple of good victories this season and none more so than on the weekend over in Perth. It's one of the hardest road trips against a team in the Eagles who bully sides over there. They really bully football teams who come to Optus Stadium. So for the the Baby Bombers to go over and collect the victory, um, to dominate the second half like they did, it was really, really impressive and it gets the six points from me. Yeah, well, with Essendon, I thought, um, you know, when they were the youngsters were playing some um, exciting football earlier in the season, I thought it was a bit of a false dawn, like a little bit of a, um, you know, a bit of they have a bit of momentum behind it, but when this momentum dies down, we'll see what they really are, and they're actually not that great, but they were just going through a purple patch. That's what I thought. Um, yeah. But after watching that game on the weekend and watching the rest of their season, so the, their season so far. Um, 
I don't think that this is just a purple patch or, you know, the kids are full of adrenaline and um, it's going to die out soon. I think that they are a genuinely good football side. Um, mm. And they could make the eight. So, which hurts my heart to see. And, uh, you know, friend of the show, Michael Allen, uh, the chosen one on the Drivel podcast, uh, he is a diehard Essendon supporter. And, gee, he's taken some joy, and rightfully so, out of watching Adam Saad leave the club purely because he thought Mm. it was the sinking ship. Jump over to what really is the sinking ship and watch Essendon propel themselves airborne. So, um, well done to you, Essendon. Uh, hats off, and you're only going to get better with the kids coming through. Uh, what's your six-pointer, Roggie? My six-pointer is Sydney, and it's Sydney because I was so envious and probably jealous watching them uh, play on the weekend because, like I said, they're such a successful club, you know, since we've been around. Um, they make finals every year, then as you do, they, they dropped out of the eight. Um, they had their run, but... Instead of being five years out of the eight or ten years like Carlton has been really um, and just getting everyone out the door and drafting all these players and playing 18-year-old kids when they're not ready and going through all that rigmarole, they found a way to do it in one and a half, two years and be right up there as a top four contender. So um, it's more than just the playing group and getting the draft picks right. It's more than just getting the right coach in. It's something to do with the fabric, the genetic makeup uh, of the football club, just the culture uh, that is so compelling and so uh, makes me so envious and why they're my six-pointer. I wish Carlton had some of what they had running through them. It's just amazing that, yeah, while you're making finals, you can still keep replenishing your list. I think, obviously, the academy helps a little bit, but, yeah, they picked up some steals in the draft over the last couple of years while they were still making finals that... Uh, other teams had the chance to get and it, it probably goes down to their the way they develop their kids more than anything uh, they probably develop their kids better than anyone else in the comp and within one or two years of being on an AFL list they're AFL ready compared to some lists where it takes three or four years to start cracking into the one so yeah the Swans it'd be amazing if they do make finals this year considering that they only popped out for one year I think they will. They're bloody exciting and who knows, they could even make the top four. All right. I think that's us done for the Back Pocket Plug Out podcast. Rog, how, how, do you, how do you go? How are you feeling? Absolutely. Of course, um, it is much better when I'm when you're by my side and we've got a gut full of curry and a whole lot of FIFA to look forward to. But, hey, isolation in my garage about to make a potato pesto pasta. It's not too bad either. I want to see some pics of the pasta. You'll get in pics of a lot more than that, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Rog, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'll be chatting to you uh, throughout the week, but we'll do this again this time next week. Um, and, yeah, I appreciate everyone who tuned in. We appreciate everyone who watched, and we'll see you all very soon for another episode of the Back Pocket Plug-In Podcast. Keep Cheers. plugging those back pockets.